Thank you all for joining us today for this month's Internet of Public Safety Things Working Group for NIPSTIC. This is the uh, actually the fourth in a series of four calls that we have put together over the past few months looking at various public safety disciplines. We looked at the impact on the PSAC, and then we looked at impact to fire service, impact to emergency medical services, and today we're going to kind of wrap up this series with a look at impact on law enforcement. We have uh, two excellent speakers today. I'm looking forward to their presentations, and I'm just going to jump right in. First, we'll have Jonathan Lewin, who is the Chief of the Bureau of Technical Services, Chicago Police Department. And Jonathan, I'm just going to turn it right over to you, and we can get started. Thank you for joining us today. Great. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm going to talk kind of quickly because we want to get all this in and then allow time for questions at the end. So this project is called the Chicago Crime Fighting Initiative. We call uh, what we built our Strategic Decision Support Centers. And the next slide will talk about why we did this. And we can go right to the next one as well. So there was a increase in violent crime, specifically homicides and shootings in Chicago in 2016. You can see that jump from 2015 to 2016. You can see how many additional victims Chicago had from 2015 to 2016 and compared to uh, L.A. So there was a sense that something had to be done. We had to do something. So on the next slide, uh, there's a quote from the mayor, which kind of describes the project, which is attempting to leverage our technology to kind of use it to ensure that our officers have the best tools to do their jobs as effectively as possible. So this effort involves Chicago Police Department, the University of Chicago Crime Lab. Uh, we also partnered with a couple people from LAPD, including Sean Malinowski, uh, Dr. Craig Yoshida, who's done work with LA, and tried to put together a, a consortium that would help us implement best practices. Uh, next slide. So this is what the, the room, and the room is kind of the centerpiece for this effort, it looks like in a, in a kind of a diagram. And then if you look at the next slide, you can actually see some pictures of what we built out. So we had a lot of technology, and I'll talk a little bit more about what the technology is, but we didn't really wrap it together in a, in a way that informed uh, resource deployment, uh, resource uh, deployment evaluation of effectiveness, rigorous kind of intelligence process that, that translated this information into action, and then, of course, the tools to be able to put information into the hands of the first responders. So there's a quick video. The Strategic Decision Support Center is a district-based high-tech nerve center that ties together operational intelligence from a host of sources. SDSC personnel use data analysis and technology tools to provide insight for decision making. A geo-based mapping system provides situational awareness. Crime forecasting software identifies areas that are most at risk for violence and gunshot detection sensors enable officers to respond more quickly to shots fired incidents. Field officers are now equipped with mobile devices to receive information from these systems in real time. By surfacing patterns in the data, the SDSCs enable commanders to deploy officers more efficiently the analysis centers on locations prone to violence and on repeat offenders. Once the people and places most at risk are identified, SDSC personnel develop mission parameters based on available resources. After the commander has made the final decision on where to focus attention and the actions to be taken, the missions are disseminated to field units. As field officers complete their missions, they collect data and intelligence that's transmitted back to SDSC personnel for analysis and inclusion in briefings, providing a 360-degree feedback loop. By constantly analyzing what has been most and least effective in this iterative mission-based process, solutions are constantly being evaluated and optimized. The ultimate goal of the SDSCs is to provide a process and an environment for collaboration and analysis resulting in fewer victims. Strategic Decision Support Center. Smarter policing, fewer victims. 
So hopefully that uh, video worked for most people. The environment that we were in prior to this on the next slide is that we had a ton of information. Uh, we had a pretty advanced technology environment. We have probably more automated systems than most, certainly most large police departments, but a lot of them were kind of disparate, disintegrated systems. And on the next slide, we show what some of those components are. So it's things like sensors, shot spotter, gunshot detection. We had in two small, three total of three square miles in the city since August of 2012. Surveillance cameras, you've probably heard about Operation Virtual Shield. So this is one of the uh, largest municipal camera integration platforms in the U.S., about 30,000 total cameras accessible. Of course, things like mapping, LPR, dashboards, social media, open source, GPS on our police vehicles, you know, big data sources like CAD, computer-aided dispatch, uh, where we have about 4.5 million calls for service a year. Our clear system, which is our police enterprise information system, Incoming citizen tips. There's a website called uh, cpdtip.org you can visit. It's powered by Tipsoft, Motorola product. Weather information, major events. We track critical facilities in the city. Things like flight tracker, that's not fully integrated yet, but that's another data source. Radio data. So on the next slide, what we wanted to build in this project is essentially a, a situational awareness platform, a notification engine that ties everything together uh, in a very consumer-friendly, very accessible way that is available on desktops in these rooms that we built. Basically, it's like a fusion center at the edge. So each of the districts that's equipped with the technology has a mini fusion center in the district under the control of the district commander, uh, but also uh, on mobile devices. So we have, obviously, in-car computers, smartphones, the version of this software, that, which is now in testing. So we started out in on a desktop version. There's a version now in testing that will run on our mobile computers under Windows, and then there'll be an Android version. Until those versions are done, officers have access to uh, shot spotter alerts, uh, real-time camera video, uh, predictive crime mapping, obviously dispatch information, the ability to perform field inquiry functions, name checks, etc. Uh, Android phones. So on the next slide, these are the technology components that we rolled out. Smartphones, predictive policing, so we're identifying areas of risk using a product called Hunch Lab from a vendor called Azavia, which is out of Philadelphia, which uses a model that integrates things like previous incidents, arrests, calls for service, weather, shot spotter data, spatial factors like locations of liquor stores, into a, uh, a risk model that then generates daily areas of risk where we can deploy resources and measure what works. Cameras, so again, we already had a lot of cameras in the districts where we implemented the technology. We added even more cameras, an average of 20% additional. Uh, so they're, they're pretty well saturated with cameras. And then as important or probably more important than the technology is process improvements. So there's now a, a daily briefing and for the first time, we hired uh, civilian criminal intelligence analysts and embedded them in these districts. So on the next couple of slides, uh, this is what Hunch Lab looks like. Uh, and basically, these uh, geographies at risk change three times a day. In the past, we would come up with kind of a static risk area that would stay the same for maybe six months, and we would focus problem-solving activities and resource deployments in those areas. This model changes three times a day pushes out to the smartphones, officers then concentrate activities in these areas of risk, uh, which are essentially predicting violent crime. Uh, next slide will show you the Genetech interface. So we were already a Genetech video management system customer, the city, Office of Emergency Management and Police Department, Fire Department, uh, other city entities use this platform to view the, the cameras, both city-owned and cameras that are part of what we call the Federation, which is uh, private sector cameras and cameras from partner agencies like schools, park district, transit authority, etc. Um, so this was a pretty robust video integration platform. We asked Genetech to build in all those data sources that I talked about, which today include uh, shot spotter, computer aided dispatch, uh, GPS on the police vehicles, incidents, arrests, LPR, all into one platform. This is a platform where as analytics mature, they'll be integrated, So that, again, so that there's one very accessible, very consumer-friendly place where we go for 
real-time situational awareness. On the back end, uh, there will be analytics powered by Microsoft Azure that will be looking at real-time incoming streams from these different sources and making connections across the sources. So let's say somebody calls 911 and says, I just saw somebody get shot. I saw somebody drive away in a red car with an X in the license plate. You can imagine that the analytics would be parsing that narrative of that call, that call to 911, looking for keywords and then associating them with other incoming data sources like tips. Uh, somebody might be sending a tip from a smartphone like uh, LPR reads where there's a car with an X in the license plate, analytics from video where you're looking for an object that is a red car. So those kinds of things are what future growth will, will uh, allow for in this platform. Genetech is now, we're calling this platform the Decision Support System, DSS. Genetech is now calling it CityGraph, and they actually showed it at IECP in Philadelphia, if anybody got a chance to see their booth. The mapping on the back end integrates with our Esri GIS environment, so we're an Esri shop. So all the maps, all the map data uh, pulls from real-time sources. On the next slide, we just talk about some of the vendors that we're using. So again, ShotSpotter, Genetech, Hunch Lab. The camera prime contractor for OVS is Motorola. Uh, so there's a lot of partner entities here. On the next slide, we talk about what the technology objective is. And again, it's just providing real-time situational awareness. So we had all these systems before. You know, we had gang information. We had crime information. We had AVL. We had dispatch. We just didn't wrap it together into a process uh, in a way that we'll now describe. So next slide, we'll talk about the intelligence cycle. And next slide, so we can go to the next slide. Uh, one more. So here is the, here's the cycle, and, and it's, it's very iterative. I mean, it's a feedback loop. Um, I actually got into an argument with Sean Malinowski when we were first talking about the concept, and he said you need to build out a physical room where all the technology comes together. And I said there's already rooms in the districts. We have roll call rooms, we have conference rooms, we don't need a separate room that we need to pay for to put screens in and have people meet. It actually became really important. It, it's become the nerve center. Uh, it's at a place in the district where it's near the district desk. It's near the watch commander's office. Uh, it's open 24-7, always staffed. It's a place where outside units can come in, uh, partner agencies, U.S. attorney, state's attorney, other law enforcement agencies, um, it becomes really important that there is a room, I think, for this to for this to all come together. Not to say it's the only place we deploy this, but the room is is really the hub. And that's the process. You can look at it informed by the data. It's informed by human intelligence, staffed by district personnel, and it runs every day 24-7. On the next slide, I mean, it's, the cliche term is smart policing. It's definitely that. I say it's also precision policing, a, a term I thought I made up, but then I heard it used at a conference, and uh, obviously I didn't make it up, but that, I think that's an accurate way of describing it, too, is that it's, it's a very precise way of identifying areas at risk, people at risk, and focusing on problems. Leveraging technology, getting officer input was really critical for this. Um, the officers, especially the younger ones, love the smartphones. They actually demand them. I have one officer from one of these districts that I actually detailed into headquarters who came up with the concept to even better integrate information to the smartphone. That's one of the leading tools uh, that the officers love. Also really critical that the officers saw that their feedback resulted in enhancements to the technology. Every one of these vendors, we had them go out to the districts. We had them do ride-alongs. Hunch Lab has been out at least probably 10 times. They're coming out again in the next two weeks. Uh, when officers have ideas, those ideas translate into product enhancements. Partnerships, really important. We talked about some of the outside agencies that are involved. This crime fighting process, civilian analysts, and accountability. So you've all heard of ComStat. These strategies and the outcomes are becoming integrated into the accountability process as well. The district commander is still in charge. They're still responsible. They still uh, develop whatever strategies they think are, are most appropriate, but they're held accountable for the outcomes. We can go through the next two slides. Um, so we're seeing improvements across the board. Um, we're seeing one thing that we're starting to look at right now that we haven't measured uh, in a couple of years is officer morale. Um, very early results are showing that the morale is improving in these districts where the officers see that their input is, is translating into process and technology outcomes. We can go to the next slide. There's a community partnership component. There's that public tip application, cpdtip.com. The tips are viewable in the situation rooms in the SDSCs. 
Let me go to the next slide. There's a lot of outreach that this informs. Um, other agencies are involved. A lot of different problem solving initiatives, which really are community policing, you've all heard about. Um, so depending on what the problem is, you're going to be engaging different stakeholders. What's exciting to me about this project is it's a platform for growth. Um, we just got a BJA, Bureau of Justice Assistance Grant, uh, out of the TIPS program, that technology innovation program, to develop a uh, real-time collaboration platform that will let these, these partner agencies engage through a secure portal look at problems, help identify strategies to solve them, and then measure what impact their own activity is having on partnering with us to solve the problem. So there'll be a lot of ways that I think this will grow. That platform will be available on mobile devices as well. Uh, next slide. And we can go right to the next one. So some of the outcomes, those districts that are shaded in red there that you see, the two that are highlighted, 7 and 11, were the first two districts to go go live. So the mayor and the superintendent ordered us to get those two districts online uh, they wanted them early this year, so we actually went online in 7, went up first in January, then 11 went up in February. The plan was only to do two of them this year and then measure, evaluate, and see what we wanted to do going forward. Based on some early results that were showing success, the mayor and the superintendent ordered that we expand to four additional districts, which you can imagine was an incredible lift with a very, very, very aggressive timeline. So we got all six districts online prior to summer of this year. The first two to go live, you know, where the process has been the most mature because they've been running at the longest, 34% decrease in shootings year to date compared to 2016. Those two are down 34%. All the SDSCs, we call these our tier ones. They used to be our most violent districts. They're down 26%. Uh, and if you take them out of the citywide decrease, the city is down 16%. So what's stunning is these districts that Last year accounted for 55% of the shootings citywide and drove up the violence for many, many, many probably decades are now driving it down. And if you take them out of the city, the city has a lower decrease than if you put them back in. Uh, next slide. So that was shootings. This is uh, homicides. Same kind of results, 7-11 down 38%. All the Tier 1s down 25%. Without the Tier 1s, the city's down 4%. Uh, next slide, we just reinforce some of these numbers. We actually used these slides at our budget hearings at City Council. Had a lot of impact. There's a lot of support, as you would imagine, from the communities. The questions that I get asked when we present this, we did a town hall not too long ago in a, in a district that does not have these centers yet. Uh, and the first question was, when are we getting them? You know, so 812 fewer shooting victims citywide. This is as of yesterday. Uh, next slide. Again, some more comparisons. Next slide. Seven, the seventh district is really remarkable. This is Inglewood. You might have heard of it. Anybody from Chicago has probably heard of it. This used to be the most violent district in the city, accounted for almost 25% of the shootings last year by itself, just one district. There's 22 districts in the city. They are now down 45% in murders and 43% in shootings. They're even down compared to 2015, which is stunning. Uh, next slide. And we'll go through these last ones fairly quickly. These are just some examples of some briefings informed by the data that you're all familiar with. We can go to the next slide. So here's a hot spot uh, that, that is predicted as at risk for uh, violent crime. It had some recent shootings. We can go to the next one. Some hot spot drivers of violence. We do have another grant-funded project also through BJA that uh, is identifying specific people that are most at risk for future violence. We try to prioritize them for interventions, social services, not enforcement, uh, but interventions to try to get them out of the cycle of violence. Next slide, this is um, going to be, these are some Hunch Lab zones. So with Hunch Lab, of course, with GPS and, and mobile data, we're able to track where the cars are going because they're all equipped with GPS. We're able to track what they're doing when they're in these areas because, of course, we have CAD data. So everything the officer does, one way or another, is recorded in some kind of a CAD event. So we can see where they're going. We can see how much time they're spending in these zones. We can see what they're doing in the zones. And then we can correlate activities to crime reduction. So we can optimize what's having the greatest impact on reducing crime. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's a weekend strategy. So it's talking about some gang activities, some gang conflicts. It's talking about some specific missions. POD down at the bottom. It's probably hard to read it, but POD is what we call the cameras. It stands for police observation device. You know, so it gets pretty granular in terms of what the analysis recommends in terms of activities. Uh, next slide. And just a few more slides on some successes. So 
one of the challenges is measuring what works and what doesn't because there's so much out there, as you saw. So the University of Chicago is trying to help us evaluate, is it cameras, is it shot spotter? Shot spotter is now completely covering these six districts. Uh, so we're, we're in about 50 square miles of the city right now. So shot spotter obviously is giving us faster detection time than calls to 911 a more complete picture of gunshot violence, and much more accurate location information. So we can catch offenders, catch ballistics evidence, you know, identify crime scenes, etc. So here's a um, social media mission looking at open source. Identified a uh, illegal party, resulted in a raid, recovered some guns, some arrests. Next one. Uh, this is a, just a stolen vehicle pattern, cars being stolen, tracked to their recovery locations, resulting in apprehension of offenders. And actually, this ended up clearing a triple homicide, as you see on, on that slide. Uh, camera arrest. So this cameras play a huge role, not just reactively, so not just when an alert happens in the platform. So the way the Genetech platform works is any alert from any of those sources, CAD data, could be a tip, uh, could be a shot fire alert. The analyst can just click on that alert and immediately bring up any cameras nearby, look at real-time video, back them up, sequence them, and play them all at once and see what happened. But they can also use them proactively by conducting what we call missions. So they can observe cameras in areas at risk, just looking for illegal activity. If they see it, then they can uh, field resources can view the video as well on their smartphones, and they can also respond. So here's one that resulted in arrest, firearm recovered, monitoring a camera. Next one. We'll just go through these quickly. Or another camera success. The camera successes are so prevalent. I mean, it's it's really incredible what a role they play. Next one, gang-related arrest, weapons, weapons recovered. Again, situation room, monitoring the activity, daily briefings. Next one, here's another camera monitoring activity. Observe shots fired with a rifle. Uh, believe it or not, they know where the cameras are. Still conduct activity under the cameras. We're also hoping that as criminals see more uh, rapid response to illegal activity, uh, that there will be a chilling effect with the cameras, you know, deterring criminal activity. And we are starting to see that now. Uh, next one, another camera mission, uh, crime arrest. Next one, and this is the last one. So here's a shot spotter uh, alert. Shot spotter reported some rounds. Uh, officers responded, located a victim, resulted in investigation that resulted in the arrest of three offenders. Um, so it's working well, but we're now expanding to six more districts. As you would imagine, now there's incredible uh, pressure to uh, expand this. Uh, so that's what we're doing now. We'll be adding six, four more districts by the end of this year, and then two more prior to the summer. When we're all done, we'll be the uh, largest shot spotter deployment in the U.S., I think we'll be in uh, over 100 square miles, which the city is 240 square miles. So that's uh, that's the project. It relies a lot on communications and mobile tech, and we'll answer questions later. Okay, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Great presentation. Do do we want to take a few questions now, uh, or hold off on questions till after Francisca? I I. I actually had a couple of quick clarifying questions I wanted to ask you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, one, you mentioned a Microsoft um, application or program, Microsoft Azure or Azure, mm -hmm. A Z U R E. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I got that written down correctly. My second question is, and you may have mentioned this and I missed it, but are you, are you looking at or are you using any type of facial recognition technology or applications with your cameras? Only post-event, um, only on still frame grabs, um, mm -hmm. only when there's a criminal predicate to uh, allow for an investigation. Nothing real-time, um, no real-time facial rec on any incoming video streams, only post-event and only still frame, and that vendor is DataWorks. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's pretty, I think that's kind of the standard way, way that uh, facial recognition is used these days. Uh, anyone else have a question for Jonathan? Yeah, this is Rod Jerkson, and Nina, uh, one. You mentioned uh, critical structure um, data availability. I assume that includes um, cameras, but what other kinds of sensors or devices are used for those instances? Um, right now, it's it's cameras. The, the, you know, the big sensors are cameras and ShotSpotter, and then there's some other 
some other CBRNE kind of sensors that are out there um, that we um, don't get into too many details on. Uh, but the, the critical infrastructure platform itself is essentially a database that's available on mobile devices and at the dispatch center for police, fire, and emergency management that has floor plans, blueprints, evacuation routes, um, key contact information. Um, schools are required to upload student safety plans and data and floor plans, et cetera, into the secure portal. Um, so it's useful for a variety of scenarios, including active shooter, et cetera. Hey, Jonathan, this is Bill Schreier. Are you using the Microsoft Aware um, app? No, we actually looked at Aware. We liked it. We went out to New York and looked at that. Uh, we looked at a couple other solutions. Um, if you if you look at the the interface uh, for our DSS, it, you'll see that it looks kind of kind of like that. Um, I personally think that we integrated a lot of features and capabilities with Genetech uh, that are that make it a very powerful, robust platform. Um, frankly, the price point uh, was a little bit too high for uh, for uh, domain aware, um, so we ended up having to go a different direction. And I, I was really happy with the results. And the the nice thing with this is though we're still using Microsoft Analytics or will be soon on the back end. So I think we're getting kind of the best of both worlds. This, Got it. Is this is Charlie Sasser. Would you be willing to share your metrics with uh, other departments that are in the process of trying to justify and get their finance people to fund efforts as you've done here? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Those are great success stories that you have and, and uh, great statistics as well. I have one more question. Uh, the, the, the SDSC room, Situation Awareness Room, I guess, is that, how, how does that integrate or work with your, 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 your PSAP and, and dispatch center? Is it a um, standalone or how, how does that work? It is standalone and the dispatch center is run by the, by the 911 center. Um, but, you know, we have access to, to real time CAD data, of course, so we're integrated that way. Um, the dispatch center can see, uh, shot spotter, uh, alerts. That's also integrated on their side. Um, but it is, uh, you know, they're two separate agencies, but they share, uh, situational awareness and there, there are real time connections between the two. Mm. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Well, Jonathan, we really appreciate your your presentation, and again, I'll echo that the your, the, the success uh, your success metrics are 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 a great story, and um, I, I I like Charlie's idea of, of promoting them. Um, uh, so so we'll we'll we actually will work on getting the word out with this group, but um, but again, I, I appreciate it and. Uh, we hope uh, we hope you can uh, maybe come back later on and uh, give us a, another update after you know a few months where we get into this. Absolutely, and thanks for having me. Sure, thank you. All right, next up we have Francisca Schuler. Uh, she's a PhD. She works for Motorola as the director of the Command and Control Business Software Enterprise. And I'm just going to turn it over to you, Francisca, and the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for having me. Yes, my name is Francesca Schuler. I'm part of the software enterprise business within Motorola Solutions. I lead various applications within the command and control segment. And throughout this presentation, I'll discuss uh, Internet of Things from the perspective of the responder within law enforcement, and I'll speak about what's available today in terms of personal area and vehicle area networks along with that you know, what will aid law enforcement and, and discuss some of the, the challenges and enablers, you know, what will provide responders with the optimal user experience, the right level of security, and provide agencies that flexibility when it comes to, to governance and, and policy. So uh, we can get to the next slide. So we're moving from, we, we're in an era of critical communications, but also in parallel, you know, mission critical intelligence. And that mission critical intelligence is really due to the, the amount of data sources, as you heard from, from Jonathan, around, you know, the data sources around us and the con connectivity around the devices that we have. Um, everything is essentially becoming a smart device, and we have a lot of examples which we'll talk about within public safety and particularly with law enforcement. 
And to give you some statistics uh, around IoT, which you, you may or may not be familiar with, Gartner predicts about 20 billion IoT devices by 2020, 7 million drones in the U.S. by 2020. And when Gartner had, had a survey towards state and pro provincial governments asking them, you know, what are the top factors that influence your organization's decision to create uh, investment or strategy around connected sensors and devices. And, and the top answer was really around the ability to do process automation. And second and third came in around improving either um, efficiency overall or business efficiency. And the, the last was really around reducing operational costs. And another Gartner survey asked organizations, state and provincial governments, about what would hinder the deployment of IoT types of solutions in the organization. And, and the first thing that came up was the upfront cost of it. And then second and third were privacy and security. So it, it used to be, if we move on to the next slide, that, that public safety had very little data to work with and, and less in the field. And now, you know, the opposite is true. And, and this picture looks a lot like some of the slides that you saw from Jonathan, that the data comes from a large variety of sources. You know, you have your internal databases, you have public social media, public cameras, databases on the commercial side, and then locally, either on the responder or in the vicinity of the responder in the vehicle, you have body-worn sensors, vehicle, you know, vehicle cameras, body-worn cameras, and so forth. And so the, the proliferation of data and the data sources are, um, are to a point where sometimes it becomes, you know, data becomes a challenge in terms of how do you actually put that data to use, uh, which we can talk about a little bit on, on the next slide. So, so putting that data to use is particularly um, difficult for public safety. Obviously, law enforcement officers in the field, you know, they, there's a lot of risk and uh, situations happening where they, they really can't have their face buried in their data device. And, and data is most critical in the middle of an incident, exactly when the officer is really in no position to receive or, or process it. So some of these peripherals and, and devices can be used to actually aid and, and optimize that user experience, things like heads-up displays, you know, things like um, being able to view, view information in a way that uh, that is easy and, and the way that the data, data is formatted and consolidated should be in a way that's easily per perceived and easily understood by the officer. In addition, not only in the field, but, um, you know, at the command center as well, data is piling up. There's lots of new sources constantly flowing, and most of the time, you know, IT has a chance of trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to store and how to protect all that data could be, you know, something in the range of terabytes of video. So finding new new ways to actually analyze and make use of the data beyond the capabilities is, is, is really today sometimes beyond the capabilities of the agency's IT staff. And yet, you know, our, our public uh, expectations are high and people are not really willing to forgive if crucial data is missed um, and if mistakes are made. So that's really the, the challenge that, that we're in today. Let's move on to the next slide. So within Motorola Solutions, we're really looking at, you know, putting expertise within the applications, devices, and the infrastructure to make sure that responders and officers get the right information at the right time um, and in the right way. And we want to, I think the, the overall goal for public safety is to take that deluge of data and make it useful by turning it into mobile intelligence. So you're not overwhelmed by the, the, the data that you have and the, only the critical pieces of information, especially when an officer is at, at risk in the field is provided. So on the next slide, I want to take a look at public safety incidents from end to end, and it's, it's really about capturing data from the data sources and being able, able to act on the data in real time to manage an incident both in, in the field and at the command center. And sort of the act capture and analyze is uh, similar to the to that uh, feedback loop that, that Jonathan showed. Is, is really you want to take capture the data, act on it, analyze it, and then feed it back as more lessons learned and best practices. In addition, you want to be able to enable those applications to be network agnostic and whether that data go over your land mobile radio network or over a broadband network, be able to get to the, to be get, be able to trans, traverse from the field, the, the officers in the field to the command center. And so the, that, that feedback loop of the act, capture act and analyze is critical and being able to get that data to the right places and, and not have the officer worry about what network it's flowing over and whether it's going to get to getting the information to the right place is, is something that the applications take on. So we can move on to the next slide. So here I want to focus, you know, first I'll start off with discussing the personal area network and the vehicle area networks and, and the art of the possible in, in the horizon and discuss, you know, mo most everything, as I think I mentioned before, most everything has the capability of becoming a smart device. And, and the personal area network of, of the officer the things that are you probably 
see and hear most in the industry today is, is really around detecting, if, if you look at the slices of the uh, responder here in the personal area network, I've, I've sensed it, sliced it into sort of what you call sensor classes. And one of the classes that you'll see in this ring are, is, is the escalation class. And that's really about understanding what's happening in the field from an officer in terms of uh, a weapon drawn or a weapon fired for an officer. And, and, and a lot of the a lot of the prevalence in the industry around escalation today and the availability of it today is linked to the process automation that it provides in terms of triggering um, a body-worn camera or a vehicle camera when certain you know, when certain events occur and taking the having to take the officer's attention off the the task at hand in order to turn manually turn on a video camera. That's sort of the primary use case that you hear about today. The other pieces here that you see in the uh, other than the, the body-worn camera and the escalation, the other pieces. Here are, are not likely a more point solution in, deployed. Um, probably not as prevalent as you as in the escalation in the, in the body worn video today. But with time, will take hold and become more prevalent. So the other uh, class that I'll talk about is really around the vitals or the officer health monitoring class. So today, you know, within your your radio or your your smartphone and with within other devices that you carry, you have some, uh, for example, accelerometer, gyroscope, motion detection. So you can detect things like, you know, a man down or the officer's activity level, um, you know, are they in a foot chase or not. The other piece that belongs in the vitals category is really around vest integration. So there's solutions out there where either you can detect whether an officer's uh, bulletproof vest has been uh, either pierced or impacted. It could be through a, a knife stab or, or a punch. Um, and be able to use that information along with the officer's location and feed that to the command center to, to you know, obviously improve your, your backup and response time. The other piece is really around, you know, biometrics and, and vitals, being able to get heart rate and, uh, and other, you know, pulse oxygenation and other health-related parameters as well. The other slice that I'll talk about a bit in the personal area network is location. Obviously, GPS is, is widely prevalent. The, the ability to get indoor and building location is not as prevalent as the, the solutions out there in terms of the accuracy that, that sometimes is demanded is, is, you know, within a couple of feet. And I know exactly what floor of the building and what room and to an accuracy within a couple of feet. That type of solution isn't as well deployed today. Um, there's, there's a lot of technologies out there. And I think the, the level of accuracy that, that is sometimes demanded um, isn't, isn't quite achievable. But it's an area where I think we are making progress and, and we'll get to a point where we can get better indoor location, especially with the um, sophistication of some of the gyroscopes and accelerometers and the degree of freedom that they, that they carry with them and some of the, the platforms that are out there today. And when we talk about, when we talk about the user experience, it's, you know, the heads up displays can be a method of, which is the other slice that you'll see in this ring, uh, can be a method of improving the user experience for, for officers so that they don't have to dig out their device from their pocket or, or from their holsters to be able to get information. They can get information in real time and critical information sort of at a glance. So the heads up display is, is not necessarily, it could be a data source as well, but most likely is, is available to mainly help to improve the, the user experience when it comes to being able to display and provide the, the data to the officer that he needs at that moment in time. So I think I've gone through all of these sleeves on, on that piece on the personal area network. Now we can go to the vehicle, the vehicle area network, which is on the right. So the same slide, I'm sorry, same slide, but on the right. On the vehicle side, there's obviously the vehicle has its own camera integration as well which is, is prevalent. Um, things not so prevalent are being able to get the status of assets within the vehicle. So, for example, if there's a, a rifle rack within the vehicle and understanding whether that rifle rack has been unlocked or not, um, removal, removal of hazmat types of uh, materials, canine removal from a vehicle, and being able to get that type of information. In addition, uh, vehicles are providing, uh, there, there are sort of these third-party retrofit solutions within vehicles where you can get access to a lot of vehicle telemetry, and that vehicle telemetry that's most popular or prevalent today is the ability to, and again, it's the, the, the integration with the body-worn camera and the being, being able to trigger a, a body, uh, either a body-worn camera or a vehicle camera when some vehicle telemetry parameters have been detected. So like, for example, your siren lights are on or your officers exited the vehicle. Um, that's probably the most prevalent today. However, we're we're working to be able to tap into other vehicle pieces of vehicle telemetry so we can drive other areas of operational intelligence. So, for example, be able to detect whether vehicles in pursuit, the vehicle is, has been impacted or, in an act, uh, for example, in a, in a crash, the ability to, to be able to get not only the assets 
and manage the assets within the vehicle that I talked about, but also be able to manage your, your overall fleet. So there's mechanisms to be able to get information about the vehicle's maintenance and service reporting in terms of, you know, tire pressure and fuel levels, et cetera, and being able to manage your fleet in a more effective way as well, and that can help reduce your operational costs from that perspective. In addition, in the vehicle, there's the aspect of, of the heads-up display, as we talked about, to improve some of the human interaction and to be able to um, improve the uh, overall user experience in terms of not having to hunt, hunt for data at a specific device, but having the, the relevant data come to you at the right time. So now we've, we've sort of covered the personal area and the vehicle area network, and so we can move on to the, to the next slide. So in this case, what, we, what you see here is some of the, the mobile applications that, that are available in, in the field and, and on the left side, and then sort of the, the applications available in the command center. And, you know, public safety has a lot of applications today, but all of these applications tend to be, tend to be isolated from one another. So I think you saw a good example of that type of integration from, from Jonathan's presentation. So the strategy overall is to have the applications within the command center be fully integrated so they're all going off of the same pool of data or tapped into the same pool of data so you're seeing, um, so the operational picture is, is identical from whether an officer in the field is looking at the data or the command center is viewing the data through an application. So each application uses a portion of that total, uh, total data and each application can contribute more to that, to that data pool. And ultimately, what, what that really enables is for us to analyze data and find new insights, which really leads to better response and prevention. So I think the example I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit um, is, is somewhat uh, relates to, uh, you can tie it over to, to Jonathan's presentation. We, I don't think we really planned it that way. But the, uh, the CAD data that you see, in, for example, gun sensor data that you see, for example, on the, the field application to the left, which is uh, that red triangle on the map, and social media data can be analyzed to spot, you know, the hot zones that might be in a specific uh, district or in a specific uh, vicinity. And that map of hot zones can be used to generate, you know, recommended beat coverage areas. Um, the coverage areas can be turned into recommended patrol routes, and those patrol routes can be distributed to officers um, and the compliance can be tracked. Each is a different application, you know, and those applications can possibly come from different vendors. However, because they're, however, they're, they're very, very effective because they're all working off that same one data pool. And so I think that's, that's really the message is to, um, even though you may have different vendors working in different areas to provide different solutions, the, the, the key is sort of integrating all of that together, uh, which, uh, which is key both in the field and, and in the command center. And we can move on to the next slide. So I'll emphasize this again as one of the more prevalent use cases that you see in law enforcement today is really using the personal area network where you have sensors for escalation in the field, for example, like a, a weapon has been drawn or fired, and basically it's triggering a, a body warrant camera and activating that. Um, it, it's about understanding also that um, information that the officer has been, you know, has, has been assigned to, an, to, to a traffic stop or has recently pulled, pulled someone over for a traffic stop. So not, none of these events on their own. Okay. So, so I guess the, the point here is is that the, the data on its own, the data points themselves on its own may not be relevant. So an officer may be, you know, pulling a, a weapon out to, at the end of his shift uh, to, uh, to empty the magazine, for example. However, in combination with the fact that he's at a traffic stop and maybe even getting some other intelligence, maybe about the, the heart rate of the officer or some other vitals information, um, it helps you to drive, drive that, that intelligence that, yes, this is something where we need to go ahead and activate the, the, the camera um, and maybe even open the mic on your, on your radio or trigger an emergency over the network. So it's, it's really about the combination of the data and making sure that uh, that, that intelligence is there to be able to uh, enable the appropriate action and then post-incident the appropriate analytics as well. We can move on to the next slide. So if, if we think back to the, to the beginning of the, of the conversation, there, there's a lot of, a lot of data that's, that's available and both, both from the field and in the back end. There's sensor data, there's license plate looks up, look up text and location. There's the voice side of things and then there's the, the data side of things. And I think the key here is that we, we, you want to be able to uh, intelligently link your applications and, and your devices such that they, they're agnostic of the network. And from, from that perspective, the, the data sources and the applications are really what own the intelligence around what 
what network and, and what, what makes the most sense in terms of your coverage, in terms of your, in terms of the availability of the devices that you have and, and so forth to be able to decide what applications are most relevant and what, what network those, uh, those applications and the data for those applications should, tra- should traverse. And the next slide, I think we're going to really, uh, talk here about the enablers and the challenges. And so, um, one thing that you might come across, especially if you're in law enforcement, you, you fully can grasp this, is that you're already carrying a lot of devices, right? Um, you have your, you know, the holsters, the weapons, um, the cameras uh, on yourself, and you definitely don't want to have more devices. And it, it's not necessarily a matter of adding more devices when we talk about IoT or sensors. It's about um, intelligently placing those sensors and devices that are already available to, to the officer on uh, things that the officer already carries. So like I mentioned, you know, they're already wearing a bulletproof vest. It's simply a matter of um, adding a sensor, or a, a panel of sensors, a mesh, for example, that can be easily and it'd be an easy either retrofit add-on or a fully or, or fully integrated. Um, and so I think at Moral Solutions, we, we we understand that you know officers have a lot to carry as it is, and it's a matter of intelligent, that intelligent integration and where you can put the uh, where you can put the sensors such that it's not adding additional burden for the officer to carry yet you know either another device or, or more more things on their body. The other um, the other piece to to think about from a from a challenges or enablers perspective is that the you know that officers from from a from a user experience perspective, uh, we talked about what, what can enable more of an improved user experience for the officer. So things like I talked about the heads-up display um, can make that data more accessible and less burdensome to access, especially in high-risk situations. There's scenarios where things like voice recognition or gesture recognition can enable just more ease of use of devices and be able to uh, make queries and searches at the device level or at the application level. Um, to be able to get the, the information quicker and in a much uh, more obviously optimized user experience. The other area of uh, when we talk about devices as well as the, you know, from a sensor and IoT perspective is the fact that officers then need to worry about charging that device and, and the battery life of that device. And I think, you know, things like technologies like wireless charging can really help ease where the officer can charge devices. So, you know, things like wireless charging are more prevalent now in the in the vehicle. So, um, even if an officer's on duty, they can have access to, you know, those charging capabilities within their vehicle or on their body to, to make it easier to manage the, the battery life of, of the devices as well. So, it's sort of another key challenge, I would I would say, from, a, from an officer perspective. And then, you know, when we talk about security, you know, most of the devices today are, are working with Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. And if, if you talk to some of the sensor providers or wearables providers, um, a lot of them leverage the security that the standards enable within, you know, within Bluetooth or within, within Wi-Fi to be able to connect those devices to either a smartphone or to a radio. And, and you really, I guess it's really up to the agency to decide whether, and, and I think leveraging what, what Bluetooth has from a security perspective helps to keep that ecosystem open, which is good. However, you know, obviously is what's defined in the standards something that obviously keeps keeps the ecosystem open. However, is it the level of security that's desired by the agency is the question. Those are that's that's the balance that, that needs to be um, discussed from from that perspective. And then and then lastly I, I just want to talk about the uh, some of the governance and, and agency policies. So it's you know when you have all of these wearables and devices it's it's really about what you want your responders to be responsible for configuring and provisioning and 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 what you think should be more of an agency policy so it's it's around you know policies around you know what type of events should trigger my camera or what what vehicle telemetry will we enable to 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 derive for example that that an officer's in pursuit uh, when he's in his vehicle and and those types of policies are really relying on agreement of both across the officers and the higher levels of the agency to have agreement on you know what what data what data is relevant what data what data really helps us to derive the best intelligence possible at, at the given time um, and those are those are things that the agency needs to to address in terms of setting policies and being able to set set those configurations and rules within the system so um, those are just some things to uh, to think about so I guess in conclusion if you go to the next slide yeah, although you know, although you have a lot of data, um, what at least what Motorola strives to provide is is making that 
uh, from a command center application and from field applications, really making everything interoperable, feeding from the same data pool to be able to integrate all your applications together, the complementary networks, having the intelligence to know what network makes sense for uh, for transmitting and your, your data at a given point and being able to provide you with that, that right information at the right time to really turn that flood of data into mobile intelligence. And so with that, uh, I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you, Francesca. That was a great presentation as well. Any questions? This is Roger Hicks at NINA 9-1 Association. For Francesca's purposes, and she may or may not know this, we're the originator and the designer of the NG9-1 process. Uh, it's coming into play. I have so many questions. <laughs> we don't have time for them, but I'd, I'd like a, an opinion, I guess, on the following. There's a super universe of IoT sensors, data feeds, so on, et cetera, along the lines that those speakers have been speaking to. There are multiple places those sensors can uh, feed to and to provide uh, information. NG91, for instance, is something that many people probably think is uh, solely oriented to individual citizen devices like smartphones and things of that nature for both voice, text, some video, and uh, capabilities as we move forward here in the future. There are some municipal and geographic sensors and IoT devices that are probably of interest to 9-1 centers and could feed through uh, into 9 to those centers. On the other hand, there's uh, FirstNet coming up, and it's certainly my impression that that organization believes they're going to have apps and sensors feeding directly to the responders and uh, possibly illuminating what the PSAP or 9-1 center sees as well. Uh, you've shown a lot of things here that would feed in a different direction. Um, my guess is that some types of IoT devices are going to be useful for multiple purposes and therefore would network in multiple ways. So uh, what do you see the uh, capability of sorting that out to be? That's one of the functions of this group is to look at the three public safety utilizations plus the PSAP or 9-1 center environment on that particular question. And you've done a lot of research on this. I'm interested in what your thinking is about how this has all got to integrate and where there's multiple uses for the same sensor information, how that's going to work from a network and logic standpoint. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so, from, I guess, uh, from, from my perspective, um, to your point, there's going to be the need to have data, right? There's, there's going to be local applications for, for the, the state and local types of agencies, and then there's going to be, um, you know, first net application, specific applications. And, and some of those first net applications may be leveraged in the state and local um, as well. Um, and I think it's really a matter of, in terms of the IoT devices, it's really a matter of ensuring that the appropriate applications have the right authorization and authentication to get access to to the data across across the national level and then across and, and at the state and local level. And as as long as in a, I think as long as we address as long as that that piece is addressed in terms of the the author if, if you're talking about dire directly accessing the data from an IoT device, right, at the application level. You're, you're going to be, you may have some type of sort of identity management, you may have some type of federation at the national level, at the state and local level, and as long as those applications are configured appropriately then, and, and the policies are agreed upon between the national, at the national level and state and local level for access and authorization, then that, that data can be leveraged in the same way across different applications, whether they be at the national level or state, state or local level. I, I, I don't see that the, uh, that you know, an IoT device would be only used at the at the first net level, and and I guess and, and, would, and would be banned from being used at the state and local level if it was local to that, for example, municipality. I think it could be leveraged. That that data point could be leveraged as, as a data source to multiple different applications in different domains. Yeah, it, it may be that the typical situation historically has been that everybody has their own idea, everybody has their own network, everybody wants their own network to do it. And Are there any other questions for Francisca? I, 
So I just want to raise a quick observation uh, that both of these presentations ha have kind of planted in, in my mind, and, and that is I, I believe we may end up seeing a new class of employee, uh, basically a prime data analyst type of position that will be necessary and, and a requirement to actually adopting some of this technology and managing it appropriately. I know that Jonathan mentioned that they hired a civilian analysts, and and I think that that Francisco's presentation also just points to the fact that we're going to need people to manage this data, and that and, and that means people with specialized qualifications that uh, we you know many agencies don't currently have on staff or a very limited number. So that that that's just another observation that I see coming out of this is that we're going to need people who have the qualifications to manage this data. Well, if there are no other questions, I want to thank both the presenters. Really good stuff, really helpful to us. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you all for joining us today.